Tonight, the Department of Justice threatening to sue Texas over a controversial border barrier. The DOJ saying these buoys recently deployed in the Rio Grande to deter migrants, violate federal law, and raise humanitarian concerns. Texas Governor Greg Abbott firing back, accusing the Biden administration of not doing enough to protect the border. This as cities nationwide try and house an influx of migrants as a caravan with more than 1,000 people heads towards the southern border. Also tonight, that oppressive and relentless heat wave. The father in Texas smashing his windshield with a tire iron to free his infant son from a hot car as temperatures hover in the triple digits. 84 million Americans under heat alerts as we head into the weekend. Our Bill Karens is standing by. Plus, DeSantis culture clashes. The Florida governor taking on Bud Light over their partnership with a transgender influencer. This as the Florida Education Board approved a controversial black history standard that includes teaching students the idea that slavery helped people develop useful skills that they then used for their benefit. The fiery response from the vice president. India ethnic violence, the horrifying attack on two women sparking outrage around the world. The region consumed by tribal warfare with more than 130 killed. India's prime minister now breaking his silence. Kidnapped teen rescue, a 13-year-old girl disappearing in Texas, discovered more than two weeks later in California. How she used a handwritten sign to escape her captor at a laundromat. Good evening, I'm Ellison Barber, in for Tom. We begin top story tonight with the Department of Justice promising legal action against the state of Texas over those buoy barriers in the Rio Grande we've been reporting on. Texas installing those buoys last week across a massive stretch of the river, a popular crossing between Mexico and the United States. The DOJ says the barriers, which are about four feet across each, violate federal law and pose serious safety concerns. But tonight, Texas Governor Greg Abbott defiant, saying Texas has a right to defend its border and slamming the Biden administration for an influx of migrants. The threat from the DOJ comes days after a Texas state trooper came forward with disturbing allegations of mistreatment of those migrants at the border. The whistleblower saying border officials ordered him to withhold water from migrants in extreme heat and push some of them, including young children, back into the river. But border officials are bracing for a new caravan of migrants making its way north through Mexico. The group, roughly 1,000 people strong. And in major cities across the country, a struggle to house the migrants that have already reached the United States. New York City Mayor Eric Adams announcing this week that his city shelters have no more room for asylum seekers. So let's get right to Priscilla Thompson, who leads us off in Texas. Tonight, Texas Governor Greg Abbott not backing down after the Department of Justice threatened to sue over a 1,000 foot wall of buoys now dividing the Rio Grande between Mexico and Eagle Pass, Texas. The DOJ firing back against the buoys that Governor Abbott deployed earlier this month in a letter writing the state did not receive proper authorization for them adding that the buoys violate federal law, raise humanitarian concerns, present serious risks to public safety and the environment. Roughly four feet in diameter, the buoys prevent anyone from climbing over them and extend at least a foot underwater, with no netting attached for now, officials say. The first 1,000-foot segment costing just under a million dollars. Abbott firing back against the DOJ, writing, Texas has the sovereign authority to defend our border vowing to continue using every strategy to deter smuggling and illegal crossings. Adding, we will see you in court, Mr. President. Advocates like Iri Neo Mujica warn the buoys won't stop migration and are dangerous. They will attempt to go under the barriers and they are going to die, he said. Texas Department of Public Safety Lieutenant Christopher Olivares showed us the buoys as they were being installed. He says they're a vital deterrent that could save lives. When we look at the amount of drownings, the amount of people that continue to cross this river, women and children, we need to try to prevent that as much as possible. Priscilla joins us now from Galveston, Texas. Priscilla, what could happen if Governor Abbott and the Texas government are found in violation of the Rivers and Harbors Act? Yeah, Ellison, if that happens, the buoys would almost certainly have to be 
removed. And it's important to note here that it's not just the DOJ. This, the government in Mexico has also sent a letter to the U.S. government saying that these buoys violate international treaties. And so there is pushback on many fronts about this. And the DOJ says that they are giving Governor Abbott until Monday to respond to their letter and to begin to show that he is removing those buoys or else they say that they will sue. Ellison? Priscilla Thompson in Texas. Thank you. The other major headline tonight, that relentless heat wave baking so much of the country tonight. Parts of the south and west still seeing temperatures pushing the triple digits. New video from South Texas shows a father desperately breaking his car window after accidentally locking his infant inside. Luckily, that child was okay, but experts say when temperatures near 100 degrees outside, temperatures inside a car can top 170 degrees. Meanwhile, in Northern California, skies are hazy from smoke drifting down from Oregon, where nearly two dozen small wildfires are burning. Let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens, who has the latest on what you can expect this weekend. Bill, the question on everyone's mind, will this heat break anytime soon? Yeah, this abnormal heat, this long duration, not just it's summer, continues. Uh, all the way from Tucson to South Florida, we added up the numbers. And so far for this July, we're on pace for our hottest July ever recorded. And if you're living in any of these areas, that shouldn't surprise you one bit. So we're still stretching from Florida with Jacksonville, Florida, and excessive heat warning. There was a location in coastal sections of southern Georgia that had a heat index of 119 today. That is extreme. And then in areas of the west where it's a dry heat, we just continue day after day. So how are we going to do tomorrow? We're going to be close to records once again for all the way in Florida. We'll be close. Orlando, Miami should break the record high tomorrow. Houston should be close, if not breaking it. Tucson should break your record high. Vegas, same for you. It's just rinse and repeat day after day in these same areas. And as far as the weekend into next week goes, the heat's going to build up to Boise, 102 degrees. And we're also working at August, warmer than average in the west and in the south. So it's just no relief. On top of that heat bill, there are some parts of this country that are seeing flooding right now. Which areas are expected to have uh, severe storms this weekend? Yeah, this has been a daily occurrence about this time. Right now, we're watching Atlanta closely. They're out under a flash flood warning. You're also in a severe thunderstorm watch, and these thunderstorms are training. They're going over the same areas here just north of Atlanta. So here's the downtown area, and you can see here all the dark red. This is where we have flash flooding ongoing in the northern half of the metro area of Atlanta. So that's going to cause a lot of problems at the airports. In Conway, Massachusetts, we have water in homes and in basements from earlier flooding. Now thunderstorms have returned to these areas, too. And, of course, we've got our eye on Vermont, too. This area is under a flash flood watch. And look at all these flash flood warnings here in Massachusetts, just outside of Boston on that 495 loop. That's not a fun Friday evening drive, either. So the way your weekend looks, we dry out in the northeast, a few strong storms in the southeast. And by the time we get to Sunday, that's when the heat begins to build. Next week, Allison, we'll be talking about areas like Kansas City up around the mid-105 to almost 110. Wow. All right, Bill Karens, thank you so much for that. The U.S. is not the only country facing extreme weather right now. In Greece, wildfires continue to burn for the fifth straight day. A heat wave there has only intensified as authorities race against the clock to contain fires that have reignited. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman is on the ground in Athens with the latest. Tonight, the Greek countryside is scorched earth, a dystopian vision of a future ravaged by climate change. In this village west of Athens, a sea of charred black and a chemical factory burnt to a crisp. This is all that's left of this home outside of Athens after a fire ravaged this village two days ago. Residents here now picking up the pieces of their lives. This resident lost six dogs, several chickens and a goat when the flames devoured his family home. How quickly did this house go up in flames? Uh, in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Ten. Were you scared for your life here? Yes. It's not over. Greek authorities say 52 new fires erupted today. As firefighters play whack-a-mole, almost as soon as a fire is contained, the heat and winds pick up and the old fires are reignited. We have been watching for the last hour as firefighting helicopters like this one have been dumping water on this hot spot here in the outskirts of Athens. While Europe sizzles under some of the hottest temperatures ever recorded, the U.S. also grappling with triple-digit temps, a staggering 86 million Americans across the south and west under heat alerts tonight. Dramatic video in Texas shows the moment a father busted his windshield with a tire iron after his baby was accidentally locked in the vehicle. 
as the city of Miami bakes amid a 41 day streak of 100 plus degree heat index. Tonight, millions of Americans flocking to Greece and Italy to escape the heat, only to find hot seas and air thick with smoke. An unrelenting summer with no break in sight. And Josh Letterman joins us now from Athens, Greece. Josh, we have seen you all day out as all of this is happening, as those helicopters have been trying to get these fires under control. How long is the heat expected to last? This is just going to get worse, Allison, with temperatures expected to surge to 115 degrees Fahrenheit here on Sunday. A third consecutive heat wave set to hit Greece next week. That one is shaping up to be the longest in Greece's history. Allison. Josh Letterman in Greece, thank you for that. Now to a key update in the classified documents trial for former President Donald Trump. A federal judge announcing the trial will begin May 20th, 2024. The move ignoring requests by both sides with prosecutors hoping it would start in December of this year and Trump's defense team hoping that it would be pushed until after the election. NBC's Garrett Hake joins us now from Washington. Garrett, if we think about the electoral calendar here, the GOP primaries start in January, but the Republican National Convention will take place in July. How could this date impact the Trump campaign and the whole election as a result? Well, Ellison, if this date holds, and I think that's a pretty big if, it actually works out fairly well for Donald Trump and his campaign. The campaign is certainly reacting that way, talking about it being a victory over what they called a Department of Justice crusade to have an unfairly early trial. But if you park this uh, trial in May, you basically would have, if you think Trump's going to be the nominee, the nomination all but sewn up by then. But you haven't hit the conventions yet. You haven't hit that kind of pivot to the general election. No campaign strategist wants to have their candidate on trial trial at any point, certainly not in the middle of the election. But there are much worse places you could park a trial than right where this lands in the electoral calendar. So President Trump's new attorney appeared on Fox today. Let's listen to a little of what he said. There's no need to appear in front of any grand jury right now. President Trump did absolutely nothing wrong. He's done nothing criminal. Mm -hmm. And he's made his case that he was entitled to take these positions as president of the United States. When he saw all these election discrepancies and irregularities going on, he did what any president was required to do because he took an oath to do exactly that. All right, so the other case the president is dealing with is the one he got a target letter for related to his actions around the 2020 election and also January 6th. Listening to his attorney there, Garrett, what did you make of that? Do you think we're getting an indication into how the president's legal team is going to defend the president in some of these different uh, inquiries? I thought the appearance itself was fascinating, Ellison, in part because this attorney, as best we can tell, was only added to the legal team this week, and he's already on television doing what the former president likes best, defending him in public. He also argued that there should be cameras in the federal court for this uh, trial if it comes to that on the January 6th and uh, 2020 election-related case. Um, that would be a huge departure from the norms for a federal trial, but it speaks to what has always been kind of the Trump strategy on this, which is to tie the legal and the political together. They want to make a political argument about what happened on and around January 6th and the, the aftermath of the 2020 election, not a legal argument. And the fact that you have an attorney ostensibly hired to defend the former president in court on Fox News, defending him to Fox News viewers instead, is just uh, the latest example of that. Gary, as someone who has covered all of the investigations into the former president, what do you think people should be watching out for as we head into the next couple of weeks? Look, I think the likelihood of an indictment sooner rather than later is the is the biggest story in politics right now. The idea that Donald Trump got a target letter on Sunday and we're just kind of waiting to see what happens with it. To me, covering covered the Department of Justice and having covered kind of these other investigations, it's hard for me to imagine a development like that, which surely the special counsel understands is functionally the same as sending Donald Trump a press release uh, when you send him that letter, that they're going to sit on their hands for very much longer. So so uh, for folks who are watching this closely, you know, keep your televisions on and your phone in your hand in the early part of next week. All right, we will do that. Garrett Hake, thank you so much. With the trial date finally set for the classified documents case, former President Trump's GOP rivals are looking to move ahead in the polls. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis looking to hit the reset button on his campaign after a fairly rocky start. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez explains. 
Tonight, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis on the trail in Utah as his presidential campaign plans a reboot. We need to win this battle. Campaign officials exclusively tell NBC News the new aim would be to run more as an insurgent candidate rather than an incumbent governor and focus on leaner, more intimate events. Campaign filings have shown the DeSantis team is burning through cash and has tapped out top donors. It's also fired about a dozen staffers, leading to questions about whether his team hired too many people too quickly. No, look, I think at the end of the day, when you, when you start, there are certain investments that you make. The governor is still doubling down on culture wars, launching a state inquiry into Bud Light's parent company, which Florida's pension fund had invested in. Bud Light has faced conservative backlash for briefly partnering with a transgender social media influencer. When you start pursuing a political agenda, at the expense of your shareholders, that's not just impacting very wealthy people, it impacts hardworking people. Bud Light's parent company now says it takes its responsibility to our shareholders seriously. Meanwhile, in Florida today, Vice President Kamala Harris slammed the DeSantis administration over new African-American history teaching standards that require middle school students learn how slaves develop skills, which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. They insult us in an attempt to gaslight us, and we will not have it. Florida's Board of Education called the changes factual and well-documented, while DeSantis is accusing Democrats of having an agenda of indoctrinating students. Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. Gabe, the Florida governor also made some other headlines as it relates to what happened in the Capitol. Yeah, that's right. On January 6th, uh, today he insisted that the attack on the Capitol on January 6th was not an insurrection, but rather a, a protest that devolved into a riot. Now, earlier in the week, he also made some headlines by saying that former President Trump should have done more, should have acted uh, more to stop uh, the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. But he's been very reluctant to talk about the issue, saying that voters should move forward. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. And now to the ongoing debate in Alabama over redistricting maps. Just hours ago, the Republican-led Congress voting for a new congressional map that Democrats say goes against a U.S. Supreme Court ruling. The court previously raised concerns that the state was violating the rights of voters and ordered them, the state, to create at least two majority black districts. Tonight, Republicans say they've reached a compromise, but some say it is not enough. NBC's Jane Tim has more. Tonight, Alabama lawmakers voting to move forward with a new congressional map after Republicans refused to include a second majority black district despite court orders. You all have basically dropped the F-bomb on the United States Supreme Court. The move comes after the U.S. Supreme Court and a federal court ruled that the state congressional map was violating black voters' rights, noting that while the state population is more than a quarter black, only one of seven voting districts is predominantly black. The court ordered the state to redraw its maps to include two majority black seats or something quite close to it. But after a special session this week, the Republican-controlled legislature claiming they came to a compromise, maintaining a single majority black district and including a second one that's 40 percent black. This is a, what we call an opportunity district on, on results of the elections. If you have a candidate that's well-funded and well-organized, <clears throat> It is, a, it is a, an opportunity district. Anybody can win it. Throughout the week, lawmakers considered two dueling maps. The House suggestion included a second district that is 42 percent black, while the Senate map included a district that is 38 percent black. But Democrats and voting rights advocates argued the map doesn't go far enough, and they say it ignores a Supreme Court ruling. They don't give all of Alabama's citizens a seat at the table for their voices to be heard. Alabama is proven to be, continuing to be uh, a very racist state. This statewide battle coming with huge national implications. Republican the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, keeping a close eye on the debate. I've talked to a few to see if they're gonna do something about it. Um, we've watched that we have a couple redistrictings out through all the places. I'd like to know where they're gonna go. NBC News confirming he has talked to Alabama legislators as they drew district lines with an eye towards maintaining his House majority. All eyes are now on Alabama as dozens of other redistricting battles plays out in states across the country. Jane Tim, NBC News.
Still to come tonight, kidnapped teen found. The 13-year-old found in California two weeks after she went missing in Texas. How she got away from her kidnapper using this handwritten note. Plus, the heart-stopping new body camera video. An officer in Michigan arriving seconds after a mother and father pulled their two-year-old son from the bottom of their pool. How he saved that child's life. And the search for two men who tied a New York City couple up inside of their home. How authorities say the men tricked the couple into opening the door. Stay with us. We're back now with an alarming story out of California. A 13-year-old girl allegedly kidnapped at gunpoint and held captive for days. How a two-word note and a good Samaritan in the right place at the right time might have saved her life. NBC's Maya Eaglin has more. Armed with just a scrap of paper and a red marker, a quick-thinking 13-year-old girl writing herself to freedom. Those two words, help me, held up to the window of a car parked at the Easy Wash laundromat in Long Beach, California earlier this month and spotted by a good Samaritan. She's my customer. She always come wash here. She told me that, yeah, yeah, I think there's a girl in need help. The eagle-eyed customer immediately calling 911 as the man now accused of kidnapping that young girl did his laundry inside. The owner of that laundromat, Touch Vong, were calling the unsettling encounter. A scary face. Yeah, he looked up down to me. I said, in my head, I said, oh, maybe something, something, yeah. Officers swiftly arriving on the scene, placing 61-year-old Stephen Robert Sablin under arrest. According to a criminal complaint, the harrowing ordeal began more than 1,000 miles away in San Antonio, Texas. Sablin accused of pulling up alongside the 13-year-old girl, holding a gun to her head and saying, if you don't get in the car with me, I am going to hurt you. The girl telling police the alleged kidnapper held her captive, driving her more than a thousand miles away from her home until that fateful moment in a California parking lot. A pair of handcuffs as well as a BB gun recovered from that car, according to the complaint. Sablin, who remains in custody tonight, charged with one count of transportation of a minor with intent to engage in criminal sexual activity. He is due in court later this month. We've reached out to his attorney, but we haven't heard back. I'm shocked, but I'm happy because the police here are rescue her. Tonight, relief in Long Beach that those two simple words and the bravery of this young girl brought that nightmare trip to an end. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. In Northern California, two administrators are under investigation tonight after a video surfaced of them making disturbing comments about students, including those with special needs. NBC's Bay Area reporter Jody Hernandez has more. Hey. Happy second day. We are at the Valley View Bar and Grill mm. right here because some of our little college park friends like to come over here and smoke and drink. This is the video that has many parents in the Mount Diablo School District reeling two College Park vice principals making disparaging remarks about students, including special ed or SPED kids. And I think some of them are SPED too, but we won't ever be able to get <laughs> yeah. rid of them. You know so. what? Not your problem. Nope. Nope. Not your monkey, not your circus. It's very hurtful and very emotional. This mother of a College Park High special ed student didn't want to reveal her identity, but she says she's appalled. What was very disturbing was the fact that they're making fun of special ed children and then another statement which I found really offensive was monkeys in a circus so referring to our children are monkeys in a circus like in my statement that I put out today I apologize to to any parent or any student who who had to witness that that video Mount Diablo Unified School District superintendent agrees the remarks are disturbing he says a formal investigation is underway and insists the district is 100% committed to supporting students with special needs. We're going to use this as an opportunity to, um, you know, to retrain, to look at our uh, processes and our procedures, and to continue to work on our, on our mindset on, on how we work with students who may be different than what we are. One of the women in the video was recently named principal of Diablo View Middle School. This mother says she hopes the district rethinks that. With those kind of point of views and that mentality, they don't belong in an educational system where there are children who do need help. The superintendent says they take the matter very seriously. He says in cases of employee misconduct, anything from a letter of reprimand to dismissal could take place. 
we tried to reach out to both of the women in the video. I spoke to one on the phone who told me neither of them could comment. In Contra Costa County, I'm Jody Hernandez, NBC Bay Area News. Coming up, outrage in India, the violent attack against two women sparking protest across the country. What that nation's prime minister is saying tonight as tribal warfare engulfs part of the region. Stay with us. Back now with Top Stories News Feed. Police in New York City are searching for a pair of thieves they say posed as FBI agents. New video shows the thieves walking into a couple's home wearing suits and carrying guns in their waistband. Police say the suspects tied the couple up and tased them while inside, making off with tens of thousands of dollars in luxury items. A life-saving rescue in Michigan caught on police body camera footage. Video shows an officer outside of Detroit racing to administer CPR to a two-year-old little boy after the child was found unresponsive at the bottom of the pool. The officer then flips him over and manages to get the child breathing again. That child was taken to the hospital, but is okay. Ocean temperatures around Florida continue to remain scorching hot and scientists are sounding the alarm. Some parts of the Atlantic Ocean at this hour measuring 97 degrees Fahrenheit. Scientists say extreme ocean temperatures like this are an immense threat to coral reefs because the coral can bleach, eventually killing it. And President Biden has chosen Admiral Lisa Franchetti to lead the U.S. Navy. If confirmed, Franchetti would also become the first woman to be a U.S. military service chief. She's currently the vice president of Navy operations. The president's decision goes against the recommendation of his Pentagon chief. Turning now to the latest on the war in Ukraine, the cluster munitions that the U.S. sent over last week have already been used on the battlefield, and according to U.S. officials, they are having an impact. Meanwhile, Ukraine says Russia launched almost 70 missiles and dozens of attack drones this week, primarily launching them from ships in the Black Sea. This after Russia pulled out of an agreement allowing ships carrying grain to sail past its blockade in the Black Sea, a decision the U.N. says could ultimately lead to a global food crisis. Now let's bring in Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. He is a senior fellow and military expert at Defense Priorities. Uh, good evening, thank you so much for being with us. Let's start with the news on cluster munitions. These are incredibly controversial munitions banned by a lot of countries, but the U.S. made the decision to send them to Ukraine with a bit of agreement in terms of how and where they would be used. What do you make of the White House saying that these are being used and they are actually having an impact? Uh, well, they're, they're definitely going to have an impact. I, I actually, when I was on active duty, in fact, I fought in the Desert Storm in the 1990s and, and used these weapons. These, uh, these they called them DPICM for dual purpose improved conventional munitions where it has 88, well, that, uh, really that round you see on the screen there, it has 88 bomblets inside of it that it will go over the target, drop it on there. Some of those bomblets uh, blow up in the air and shoot shrapnel down on black skin vehicles or cable. The other ones hit the ground and send a shape charge down to potentially take out tanks. So that's much more than you'll get from a single impact of a 155 millimeter shell that they have been using. The problem is that it's also spread out over a large area and, and it takes a lot more of them to have a lot of damage. So it's very powerful but only if used in combination uh, with other offensive operations uh, in coordination and in sufficient numbers. The U.S. said they made the decision to send these munitions in part because it was a way to give ammunition, but ammunition that would go further than kind of the one-for-one -one situation they were having before. But there are often a lot of civilian casualties associated with cluster munitions. There's always the risk that they don't all go off. And then you have a situation where kids can pick them up not knowing what they are and they can really harm people. Do you think the U.S. made the right decision sending them? Yeah, you know, I, when you get into a war, uh, a lot of things that you might prefer to do uh, get set aside because of, of necessity. And in this particular situation, too, there's a couple things at play. Number one, we don't have enough of the regular conventional shells to send. We've almost given more than we should already to deplete our own resources, and there's not enough on the Ukraine side. So this is what we have handy and what we're going to use. The Ukraine side, on their, on their, for their part, where these are going to be used, have said, look, there's already millions of mines already on the ground, and this is something we'll have to deal with later. But in their view, 
they can't do with the insufficient quantities because it might help them lose the war. And that's something that they're just not willing to do and the risk they're willing to take. And only the people on the ground really can make that call. Let's talk about what we're seeing since Russia has left the grain deal. Uh, there are reports that about 60,000 tons of grain was destroyed in an attack launched by Russia uh, in ports in Odessa. There are also reports that Russia has said it plans to consider all vessels sailing toward Ukrainian ports on the Black Sea as military cargo. The White House warning about the possibility of Russia targeting civilian ships in this area. Where do things go from here? Yeah, like everything else here, this has got to be viewed in context. And in the context, Russia has been saying adamantly since May, when this was last, re, uh, this the grain deal was last extended up until this July here, uh, that look, if, if the West will meet the conditions that they agreed to earlier, which is that they want a uh, ammonia pipeline opened up, they want their agricultural banks back on the SWIFT situation and limited sanctions relief on the agricultural sector. Apparently, the West has agreed to this, but they haven't done it. And so the West said then, or the Russians said, then we're also going to pull out of the grain deal. In terms of the, the attack on the ports, Russia is stepping it up, and they are definitely escalating the situation by saying, if you're not going to do the grain deal, if we can't benefit, then you're not going to either. They've knocked out a lot of those port facilities. Uh, in terms of the last point you mentioned there about Russia saying that they would consider anything uh, military that was going into Ukraine, Ukraine uh, hours later made the same statement. So mm -hmm. both sides have claimed that they could potentially hit civilian ships going in either direction. And all of those things are, uh, you know, concerned to us because anything that could potentially escalate this war is bad for everybody involved. And I, and I think this is a very concerning situation. Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, thank you so much for that important context. We appreciate it. Thanks, sir. We move on now to the growing anger in India, where a deeply disturbing video showing the shocking treatment of two tribal women at the hands of a mob has ignited nationwide protests. The incident part of a growing conflict between two feuding ethnic groups. A warning tonight, some of the details may be difficult to hear. Tonight, outrage across India as distressing video appearing to show the brutal treatment of two women catapults a bitter ethnic feud into the national spotlight. These screenshots taken from a cell phone video showing two women paraded naked through the streets in the Manipur region of India by people police describe as unknown armed miscreants. Out of respect for the women, we are not showing that video in full, but it was allegedly taken in May moments before they were sexually assaulted. One of the victims told the Associated Press, quote, they forced us to remove our clothes and said we will be killed if we do not do as told. They abused us. They touched us everywhere. The violence depicted emblematic of the near civil war in a region that has seen villages rampaged and homes torched to the ground by mobs. More than 130 people have been killed and tens of thousands displaced since May. A bloody battle between the Kuki people, a tribal group that lives in the hills, and the Métis, the majority group that recently demanded special tribal status, which would allow them to buy land in those hills and strengthen their influence in government. Militias on both sides taking up arms to defend what they believe is their homeland. Of course, that's good. Who's not afraid of that? We all are afraid of dying. But when there is no option, what do we have? What, what option do we have? The women in the video belong to the Kukizo community and were attacked by a mob of Meiti men, according to the Indigenous Tribal Leaders Forum. Today, they are said to be safe in a refugee camp. <laughs> The video so shocking and seen so widely, it forced Prime Minister Modi to break his months of silence on the tribal feud. He's vowed that the guilty will not be spared. Saying whatever has happened with the daughters of Manipur will never be forgiven. Manipur's chief minister says police have made an arrest in the case. But it wasn't enough for some. According to state officials, some have tried to take justice into their own hands, setting fire to the house of the main suspect in the case. <laughs> With more than 60,000 people displaced in Manipur so far. We are not safe here. They attack 
anywhere, anytime. Locals on both sides of this violence are trying to rebuild and remember those already lost. The National Human Rights Commission of India now ordering a full report on this incident to be completed in the next four weeks. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Ellison Barber in New York. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.